Praise the Lord, everybody. We do thank God for being here once again. Amen. For everyone who's tuning in at home, we do thank you all for tuning in right now. We're going to ask you to share this broadcast. Amen. As we go live. Amen. Lord, we thank you right now, God, for another service right now, God. Ask you to move by your anointing, oh God. Ask you to move by your power right now, God. Oh God, some need you for one thing, oh God. Oh God, someone's pleading for another, oh God. We need you to be a God in the midst, oh God. Oh God, send forth your power today, oh God. Oh God, send forth your anointing today, oh God. Oh God, move by your power. Saturate us with your anointing, oh God. Oh God, go into living rooms today, oh God. Go in touch and heal, oh God. Oh God, go into hospital rooms, oh God. Heal and deliver today, oh God. Only you can do it, oh God. Only you can heal. Only you can deliver. And only you can set free, oh God. We decree it. We call it done. Hallelujah is the highest praise. In Jesus' my name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, we do thank y'all for joining us. Amen. We do miss everybody. Amen. Being with us here at Living Hope. Amen. We truly count it a blessing to be in your presence one more time. Just to give God praise. Just to give God glory. Just to give God honor. We hear no other reason but to give God praise and glory today. We do thank God, amen, for allowing us, amen, to gather one more time. I know some of you are joining us from your, your homes and from your cars and from your living room. It's just not the same as y'all being here. We do miss y'all actually being here to fellowship. But one day we're going to get together again one more time. Amen. And we thank God for that opportunity. Amen. For us to come together and join, and join us one. We do want to go to um, our titles pledge. Amen. And get our receive our offering. Amen. You know, at home, we still do the same thing we do if we was all here in church. We would be uh, reciting the titles pledge together. Amen. Amen. And it reads, upon the authority, by the orders of your word, I give cheerfully today, and it shall be given to me, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I'm a tither. I bring my first fruit, my tithe, into your storehouse. I understand that every good gift comes from you. As I give, the enemy is rebuked, and the curse is broken. You poured upon me such a blessing, there's not enough room to receive it. I shall be blessed going in. I shall be blessed going out, and all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. If you believe that right there in your living room, let's give God praise. Amen. Because truly, he's worthy. And truly, we thank God for our opportunity to give. Amen and amen. At this time, we are moving a little swiftly here, just me and Pastor. Amen. Today, as we uh, get ready for our leader, let's pray one more time for God to touch the man of God. Amen. In this difficult time, not seeing all the members here. And to do something to us, amen. But we want to pray for our pastor and his wife right now as he before he come and bring the word of God. Amen. Lord, we ask you right now, God, to touch our pastor right now, God. Ask you to move by your anointing, by your power, God. Lord, speak through the man of God today. He has a word from you, oh God, to give to us right now, God. We believe it, oh God. We call it so done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, Pastor Johnson is coming. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everyone. It's so good to be here on a Sunday morning where God is doing great things. Um, Brother Robertson, it's just so good to see you and it's been a while since we've been together and I, I was just telling him just a moment ago, I just can't wait till we can all sit down, have a big steak together at a restaurant and life get back to normal again. But uh, it's so great to be with you here on a Sunday morning. What a beautiful day that the Lord has given us. We've had a beautiful week here in uh, the Mobile area, around 85 degrees. And so if we have to be stuck inside, I'm thankful that we have beautiful weather. This is Palm Sunday. Happy Palm Sunday. Turn to the person next to you and say, Happy Palm Sunday. It's a beautiful day that God has given us. We know it's a very special day as we commemorate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. That means next Sunday is Easter. I'm excited about Easter Sunday. We're going to have a dynamic church service. Invite all your friends and family to be a part of it. It's going to be terrific. I don't want to wait a whole week, though, to celebrate the goodness of God, I want you to focus on the greatest love story ever, ever told all week long. Turning to Philippians 4 and 4, I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. And it says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Verse 6 is our key scripture. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, 
with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. What is so neat about this scripture for those of you who saw our Facebook page and saw Sister Sprague's devotion of all scriptures she could choose, she chose this one. How fitting to know that God has everything in his hands. Today we will be beginning a new sermon series titled Anxious for Nothing. I understand that we as a church and as a community and as a nation, we're going through difficult and uncharted territory. My prayer is that this series will help to bring a calm to troubled water. For lesson one, I'd like to speak on this thought, getting free from the prison. Before we go any further, I want us just to stop and pray one more time. Now, I understand where, whatever, wherever you're at, you may have a lot of things going on. There may be distractions. I'm encouraging you right now, just turn off the distractions right now. Turn anything that could keep you away from this word. This is a word that we as a congregation, we as a community need to hear. And let's pray together. Lord, I thank you so much for allowing us to be together. I thank you so much for your presence, which is so thick in this place right now. God, you see how as a congregation we miss each other, but I thank you, Lord, that you're with us through this word today. Let it minister to all those who are watching. Let it be done in Jesus' name. Amen. It starts with a single drop of concern, a seemingly good reason to be worried. The drop leads to two or three more drops until they combine for a slow trickle. Ever so slowly, the trickle begins to increase until it is a steady flow. Soon, like a water leak, the trickle begins to erode at the very core of a believer. It's like a cold wind that won't stop howling, a burn that won't stop burning, a pain that won't be calmed. And the culmination of all of this begins to affect the very heart and soul of a believer. Suddenly, there is no time for relaxation. There is no joy on the journey. There is no peace for each passing day. It's a spinning of the mind, a turmoil of the heart, a tingling that shudders the soul. It's an encyclopedia full of what-ifs, a dark tunnel of doom, a place where there is no promise of light. It's called anxiety. It can cause your eyes to twitch, your teeth to grind, your stomach to churn, and your blood pressure to rise. In the U.S. alone, it's attributed for a $300 billion loss due to medical expenses and lost wages. It is no respecter of person. It attacks the young and the old alike. And if all of us are being completely honest today, it is something that has tried so desperately to grip all of our hearts, even this week. A pandemic, disease, death. Someone under the sound of my voice today had a difficult time sleeping last night. A business owner, yeah, you're watching me right now, and you wonder, will my business survive everything that's going on? to that mother who's here right now, and you're worried that your children will get this terrible virus. It's real anxiety. But today I've come to tell you that we look to the one who has all power. He's the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hill, the great I am, the healer, the deliverer, the first, the last, the peace speaker, the one who speaks to storms, the one who has my tomorrow's in his hand, God manifest in the flesh. And he's right with us today. He's right with you in your living room right now. 
I want us just to pause to recognize that he's with us at this very moment. Yes, here in the sanctuary he's with me, but right there in your living room, can you just stop for a moment and let's give him praise. Lord, I thank you that you're here with me right now. Even as I speak these words, your presence is here. I thank you that you do never leave us alone, but you're always by our side. I thank you even right now someone is getting healed. Yes, as they watch this broadcast, someone is getting healed in Jesus' name. Yes, I'm so thankful for it. Today I'll be bringing you three points on getting out of this prison called anxiety. I can promise you, if you'll write these down and use these, they're going to give you strength in the days ahead. Point number one, write it down. Anxiety is unavoidable, but the prison of anxiety is optional. Yes, we all face anxiety at times. Has anyone been in the house with all your kids this week with a couple of dogs? Has, have you felt anxiety like I have? I think my dogs are barking at every squirrel within a mile radius of our home. I bought a dog deterrent that's supposed to get them to stop barking, and they're barking through it. Anxiety. Opie Taylor is about ready to be taken to a different county. The walls are closing in. And then, guess what? The dogs decide to take an afternoon nap. So what do we have to enjoy? An afternoon coronavirus press conference where we can hear more of what's happening around the world. I wonder what the new regulation will be today. But pastor, I thought this Christian life was supposed to be free from stress. Why am I dealing with all this turmoil and everyone else seems to be okay? Well, I want you to first remember this. You really have no idea what someone else is going through. You know why? We put on good facades. We, we put on good masks. You, you ask someone, how are you doing today? Fine. No, you're not doing fine. You feel lousy. You can't even go to the grocery store. You haven't had a good blue bell in two weeks. No, you're not fine. But have you ever met someone who lives in a prison of anxiety? Someone who never seems to get out of stress. It's always stress. And then there are others who seem somehow to rise above adversity. It seems like they're always full of joy. If you've had a chance to watch the devotion by Sister Sprague, as, as you watch it, did you notice the peace that she spoke with. It was a calm. It was such an encouragement to me. Why is it every time I see her, I feel peace and joy and I feel encouraged? Is it because she's not been through anything? Oh, I can tell you, she could give you books of things that she's been through. I've never talked to Brother Anderson when he didn't make me feel better about my day. Both of them have gone through stuff They've gone through anxiety and stress, but they've learned that they did not have to stay there, that God would bring them out of that, that they could get their joy again. They decided to live outside of that prison. This brings me to point number two. Keep your focus on him. You see, it's easy in the middle of a storm to focus on the elements that are going around and you forget about the one who has all power. In Matthew 14, the disciples were sailing when this storm came up. I'm talking about a storm like hit Mobile this week. You know what I'm talking about. The skies got dark. The winds were blowing hard. Rain was coming from every different direction. I'm talking about a real storm. You're in a ship. Now what? All of a sudden, there is a ghost walking towards the ship. And he says, I am Jesus. Now, what would you do in that moment? Thunder, lightning, and ghost. Sounds like a scary campfire story. But the ghost was Jesus. And Jesus said, Peter, come walk on the water. Now, how many of you would actually have gotten on the water? Be honest. Very few. Uh, I don't know if I would. Well, Peter was brave. I mean, I could change truck tires, Brother CJ, but walking on the water, I mean, that's a whole nother level. But he decided to walk on the water. Let's turn to that scripture, Matthew 14, 28. This is what it said. 
And Peter answered and said, Lord, if, it, if it's really you, bid me come unto thee on the water. And Jesus said, come. Okay. And Peter was come down out of the ship. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. He was on the water. He was walking on the water. Who was he going to? He was going to Jesus. He had his focus. Verse 30. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sing, crying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Verse 32. And they, when they were come unto the ship, the wind ceased. Now, did you notice what caused Peter to sink? You might be saying, well, it was the wind, it was the water that was all messed up. No, it wasn't that. Peter was going to be just fine in the storm. What caused Peter to sink was that he changed his focus. As soon as his focus turned to the problems in his life, instead of the problem solver, he got himself into trouble. He was trying to figure out, how am I going to stay up? How am I going to stay out of this water? He was trying to figure it all out. When the problem solver said, come on, you're good. You see, could it be today that our master is saying, you're going to be just fine, but we are so focused on press conferences and regulations and all these different things that we got our focus off the one who has all power. And when we do that, we will sink. I'm about ready to ask a tough question, so buckle up. I want you to think about the, the greatest need in your life right now, the greatest need that you have in your personal life. And here's the question I have for you. I'm, now, again, I'm talking about something that's gnawing at you, that you're really worried about, really stressing you. Here's the question. Have you prayed about it this week? I mean, have you really sought God about it? Turning off the noise and getting desperate. I'm not talking about, oh, God, take care of my family this week. Amen. I'm talking about, God, save me. I'm talking about, you're sinking and you need some help. I don't know about you. Our nation is in desperate need of some people who will travail in the spirit, some prayer warriors who will forget everything else and say, God Almighty, I need you right now. Sometimes the reason why anxiety has overtaken us is because our focus is on everything except for our master. This week, I challenge you to redirect your focus onto him. Maybe turn off the news Turn on some prayer music, whatever it takes. Psalms 34 and 3 says this, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. How do we magnify him? By lifting him up, by praising him, by thinking about his goodness and his grace, by thinking about the miracles that he's done, by thanking him for everything that we have in our life right now, by allowing him to have a throne in our life. This brings me to point number three. Faith and fear cannot reside together. You see, it's easy to preach about faith. It's easy to take notes about faith. It's easy, easy to tell your friends how they need to have faith. But then life hits you. And just like Peter, we begin to sink. What we need to ask ourselves is this question. What are we feeding right now? Our faith? Or our fears. So let's say you go to the doctor and you have a pain in your stomach. Oh, my stomach hurts. Oh, it's really bad. After the doctor takes your temperature, uh, which by the way, you might not want to go to the doctor right now. You might want to wait until a few weeks. All right. You go to the doctor. The doctor says, oh, you're going to be just fine. It's no big deal. All right. But as you leave, the doctor says, now don't start Googling about your symptoms. Don't start Googling. What do you mean don't? My doctor said this to me. Okay? I was in a doctor's appointment. Uh, I was having some symptoms. Don't start Googling. Okay. What's the first thing you want to do as soon as you leave there? What is this doctor trying to keep me from? So, of course, do the little Google. Stomach pains. What's causing it? 
Well, if you do that, you get about a two million different search functions there, and you'll find out that you have a bad gallbladder, your appendix probably needs to come out, and it's highly probable that your last surgery, that there was a surgical towel left inside. Boy, that went downhill quick. Why did the doctor tell you not to Google your symptoms? Because doctors know human nature. Many times we feed our fear instead of feeding our faith. And once you begin to feed that monster, its appetite is never satisfied. Once you go down fear road, it's a long road and it's a never ending road. All right, let me ask you a question. Don't lie. How many of you have Google symptoms of coronavirus this week? Come on. How many of you done it? I have too. Then more, one morning I woke up, woke up with a sore throat. Yeah, it's one of the symptoms. And you know what I felt like saying? You saw that little meme. Is that you, Rona? Yeah, that's what I felt like saying. And then I remembered what happens every April in Alabama. It's this deadly thing called pollen. It's of the devil. And I'm allergic. So you know what? I'm not going to focus on what I could have or how sick I could be. What I'm going to focus, I'm going to feed my faith. I'm okay. I'm here in the house of God. I miss all of you, but I'm glad to be in the house of God. Amen. You see, let me show you the difference. Fear says we're all going to lose our jobs. But faith says that God is in control. Fear says that no one will receive the gospel because the doors of the church aren't open. But faith said we are reaching more people now than we ever have before because God is using this for his glory. Fear says I'm going to lose everything. But faith says I'm a child of God and God takes care of his children. Today I'm here to remind you, anxiety can't take over your mind unless you allow it to. But how do we prevent this from happening? This is what we need to do. We need to learn to take spiritual authority over anxiety and fear. Too many times. It takes people down because they don't take authority over it. So what do they do? My wife was in the grocery store this week and one of the rare times that she was there. And we're trying not to make many trips to the grocery store, but while she was there, she was just overwhelmed by the amount of alcohol that was being purchased. Let me tell you what's happening. People are overwhelmed. So what are they doing to get rid of their anxiety? If I could just drink this, I'll forget it. This is all happening. If I can just take this pill, if I can just get this hobby, if I could just binge on this series, if I could just do all these things. But can I tell you, child of God, we must confront the problem. We've got to say this is fear and anxiety. I'm exposing it for what it is. I'm a child of God. I have freedom in the name of Jesus. This is what you're going to have to do in the days to come. You're going to have to lay your hands on your head and say, in the name of Jesus, this is my mind. I claim peace and joy. I claim prosperity. I ask you, God, to be with my family in the name of Jesus. Enemy, you're not going to take my mind. I'm a child of the King. I claim the blood of Jesus over my mind and my family in Jesus name you've got to tell the enemy you are not going to dictate what I do and what I don't do you are not going to keep me from my blessing you are not going to keep me in constant turmoil you're not going to keep me up at night I claim peace in Jesus name and what am I going to do I'm going to turn to the word of God this is what it says, 2 Timothy 1 and 7. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Come on, someone right now. I know your mind might not feel that way. That's what he promises, and that's what we need to claim. For I know the thoughts that I have toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. Philippians 4, 19. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And my last scripture is the very one we started with. 
Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. You see, this peace doesn't make sense. It will guard your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. His name is Nick, and he lives in California. Most people would call him highly successful. I'd say so, considering he's hosted more than 3,500 talks in 63 different countries. His total reach has literally been in the millions. Convention centers fill up just to see him as he comes and speaks. He is so successful. But you see, Nick wasn't always this popular. Yeah, I know he appears to be very confident now, but at one time he was suicidal. He felt like a failure. He felt like a nobody. Surrounded by fear and anxiety was just his part of life. Why? You see this picture. Nick was born with a disorder that left him without arms and legs. Some would even say he should have been aborted a disgrace to society. But he had parents who believed in him. And they told him this, don't feel sorry for yourself for what you don't have, but look at what you do have and allow God to use it. They did not allow him to live in a prison of fear and anxiety. That didn't mean it was easy. Can you imagine living without arms and legs? Imagine going to school, getting made fun of. During his teen years, Nick said he went through deep depression. But before he left high school, a school janitor came up to him and said, you know what? You would be a tremendous public speaker. Nick took that dream, gave it to God and said, God, here I am. If you can use me, take my life. Instead of focusing on what he didn't have, he focused on what God had already given him. And this is what he said at a recent talk. Life isn't about having, it's about being. You could surround yourself with all that money can buy and yet still be miserable. I know people who have perfect bodies, but they don't have half the happiness I've found. I've seen more joy in the slums of Mumbai and the orphanages of Africa than in wealthy, gated communities on sprawling estates worth millions. Why is that? You'll find contentment when your talents and passions are completely engaged in full force. He goes on to say, Resist the temptation to grab for material objects like the perfect house, the coolest clothes, or the hottest car. When you look for happiness in these things, they are never enough. Look around, look within, and look to God. And he finishes with these words. We can't and we should not compare sufferings. We come together as a family of God, hand in hand. We stand upon the promises of God, knowing that no matter who we are, no matter what we're going through, that God knows us and he is with us. He's going to pull us through. It was Nick's focus on the one who has all power instead of looking in the mirror at all the problems that he had that got him through. Nick should have been suicidal. Some would say he should have taken his life at an early age because of everything he's been through. But you know what? He turned to the one who had all the answers and he rested in him. And even today, millions of people are enjoying his ministry because he's decided to surrender to God. I'm going to leave you with an acronym that I want you to put on a refrigerator this week. The word is CALM. CALM. 
The five verses in Philippians 4, 4 through 8 lead us to the wonderful promises in verse 7. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. The C in calm, celebrate God's goodness. The A in calm, ask for God's help. The L in calm, leave your concerns with God. And the M is meditate on good things. Hear it one more time. Celebrate God's goodness. Ask for God's help. Leave your concerns with God and meditate on good things. If you will do these things this week, there will be a calm that comes to your mind and a calm that comes to your home. Right now, I want to pray over everyone watching right now. You see, there is so much turmoil right now, and we need to just ask God to bring a calm to the storm. Jesus, right now, I thank you so much that you have all power. You're in this place right now, and you're with everyone who's watching. God, I don't know what some are going through right now. God, you see the healthcare worker right now who's so concerned about everything going wrong and coming home and giving the virus to their family. You see the business owner worried about business. You see the elder who's worried about their health, God. So much turmoil right now. I'm asking you, God, to bring a calm to the storm. I'm asking you, God, right now for that person who's struggling all alone and wonders, God, do you even see me? I'm asking you, God, to wrap your arms around them right now. Let them feel your presence near. God, this is a time when we don't know what to do at times. We don't know where to turn. But God, I'm not going to turn to the things of this world. I'm going to turn to you. And if you're watching right now, you've never repented of your sins. You've never been baptized in Jesus' name. You've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm challenging you right now. This is a perfect moment. What does it mean, Pastor, to repent of your sins? It means to say, God, I'm sorry for my sins. But not only that, but it's turning from your wicked ways and saying, I'm starting over. You can do it in your living room right now. You can say, God, I'm sorry. In fact, let's do it together. God, I come before you right now. I repent of my sins. God, I repent of the anxiety and stress I brought on myself by not turning to you. You see that person who's watching right now, God, and maybe this is the very first time in their life they've repented. I'm asking you, God, to give them a fresh start and a new beginning. God, you see the tears welling up in that person's eyes even right now. You know everything that they've been through, all the mess they've been through, but I know that you are the great restorer. You can take anything and make it perfect, and we need you to do that right now. In Jesus' name. And that's the first step. But can I tell you, you need to be baptized in Jesus' name. And we'll baptize you in Jesus' name. You'll go down in the water and come up a brand new person. And the Bible says you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And if you've received the gift of the Holy Ghost, now is a time more than ever before that you need to be speaking in that unknown language. Don't, don't just clutter your mind and your life with so much stuff that you forget to pray right now. I, I know we're all inside, but I need someone to travail this week. I need someone to get desperate this week. I need all the saints from Living Hope. I need you to get desperate and pray for our country. I need you to pray for our leaders, our government, our president right now. Let's do that. Jesus, God, from our president to all the leaders of our country, we need you to do a work. We're going to do it through the calmness of your presence. We're going to celebrate your goodness. We're going to ask for your help. We're going to leave the concerns in your hands. And we're going to meditate on good things. As we close this broadcast... Let's just pray one more time for every family represented. Jesus, God, I thank you, Lord, for being with Jeremy Adams right now. I thank you, God, for continuing to heal his body. I thank you for touching Sister Vivian. You know exactly where she's at. I thank you, Lord, for continuing to be with our elders and give them strength. I thank you, Lord, for being with Stephanie right now. God, you're helping her recovery. God, you see all the needs 
in our congregation right now. The one who is heavy hearted, the one who doesn't know where to turn. But as a congregation, as a people, we turn to you. We don't have the answers. We turn to you. God, I'm asking to be with every member of the congregation, every leader, every care group leader, God. I'm asking you, Lord, to be with every young person, God. You know exactly what our community is going through. Be with our mayor right now. Give him wisdom. Be with everyone in our region, God. Continue to touch those. God, you see those who have the virus right now. We're claiming healing in the name of Jesus. God, I'm especially calling out the youth pastor in Illinois, Andrew Kaufman, right now. He's struggling for his life, 37 years old. In the name of Jesus right now, God, go to that hospital room. Do a miracle, God. Andrew has always served you, God. Would you touch his life and raise him up and let it be a miracle that you receive glory and honor for. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So let the calm be in your life this week and share it with someone else. Celebrate God's goodness. Ask for God's help. Leave your concerns with Him and meditate on good things. May this word bless you in Jesus' name.